complex anatomy uh, in endodontic treatments, a bit of a challenge, challenge for everyone. And um, in particular, those circumstances where we have a canal that divides to two uh, deep down in the canal system. And, and today we're going to talk about clinical tips and tricks, how we can overcome that and hopefully lead to a bit more consistency uh, in your endodontic treatment. Yeah, we've got two lovely cases, two premolar cases, and uh, um, we're just going to go over a few uh, difficulties they encounter in treatment and a few ways of solving it. Uh, we're going to keep it simple. And it's not that we just come up with these questions, isn't it, John? We, we get people that ask us <laughs> uh, questions. And uh, this was the one that came in uh, recently. Yeah, absolutely. Shout out to Anish, who is uh, he's contemporary endo alumni. And uh, Anish very kindly, this is off the back of one of our recent Instagram cases, was asking us, you know, nice work, but how do you deal with these deep bifurcations? And we thought, you know, as with always with our teaching, let's go through a clinical case uh, and we'll go step by step. And hopefully there'll be some some interesting points we can tease out of it. So, Luca, over to you. This is your case, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, um, it was it was, uh, it was just treated it recently. So as you can see, <clears throat> the, the tooth in question was our <clears throat> upper upper right uh, first premolar. Uh, lovely lady who had composite veneers placed on this on this floor. So you can see there's a lot of restorative material there. Um, there were symptoms from the tooth. It was tender on biting, and there was actually several episodes of swelling from this from this tooth as well. Um, and the way we assess uh, these radiographs is we we crown down. So we look from the from the crown to the, of the tooth all the way to the to the root. Uh, lots of restorative material. So in my head, I'm already thinking there's going to be calcifications in, in the coronal aspect. I might not have that lovely pulp chamber feel to fall into with a burr. I move on to the middle part of the tooth and I can see a canal. So there's hope there because I can see something. And then as you go apically, that's when things disappear a little bit. And I think we've got a, a couple of annotations. And <clears throat> just to make sure that everybody knows that these are not my drawings, but but John's, just in case we... Uh, people wonder how shaky my hand is. <laughs> but as you can see, there is something there. A canal is visible and then it disappears. And it's the same principle as the ID nerve when you look at OPGs, uh, deviation of the nerve uh, direction, loss of, of, the, of the visibility of the nerve means that something's happening. There's either a, a deviation, a narrowing <clears throat> or, or a split. And in this case, uh, I have a periapical radiolucency at the end of the tooth. So that that black area that's uh, highlighted which means that there has to be something there has to be a canal that we can find um when i see a tooth like this uh i do use uh, cbct scanning uh i don't know if it's the same for you john for these this type of teeth yeah totally and i, and I think particularly for me um with premolars where you, you kind of get a bit of a, a hunch don't you there's there's something wrong there's something a bit different here the anatomy is going to be it doesn't quite mm. fit the usual single root or two rooted premolar so you start looking mm. at it thinking okay i need a bit more info and cone beam it just yeah. gives you that that extra bit of info and and obviously we can see the the bifurcation here it's like quite interesting isn't it if you look at the next slice loco what, what are you seeing here on yeah. this now I think what's really useful is to look at the morphology of the root. So uh, canals can be so fine that are not picked up by the slices of the CBCT. So what I'm looking for here is the morphology of the root of the tooth. And as the three arrows point, they're pointing to three different roots. You've got two buckles and one palatal. Now, it, it's you, you can't really make out the canals, but I can see the... Uh, the sides and the, the shadow of the roots, so, which is making me understand where those canals might be. Um, and that's what they normally are on, on premolars. You have two buckle roots and one palatal root. That's what normally happens. The difficulties in determining where the split is. Now with the CBCT, I have a, a good idea of where it might split. In this case, with the previous slide, you could see there were two, and then all of a sudden you have, you have three now. You mentioned that you can't see the canals, but you can see the outline. Um, mm. It's quite important because often I think when you're looking at cone beam, particularly on premolar teeth that have got uh, a calcific change anyway, quite often these canals are quite small. Uh, and so our cone beam, for example, even in high res mode, is only going to pick up uh, canal diameters at 0 0.08 millimeters, so a size 8 uh, K file in diameter. Mm -hmm. But I think you, you highlight it beautifully. The fact you can see the outline 
gives you an indicator that you are going to have three canals here. And just because you can't see the canal doesn't mean you're not going to be able to get down it with with a certain yeah. protocol, perhaps dealing with a, a kind of a more calcified mm -hmm. canal. Would that be a, a fair assumption from your end as well? Uh, totally. So it, it, it's often the root morphology that dictates where I'm going to look for the canal, not necessarily what the spot that I see on the on the scan. I think that's really important. Uh, and there are statistics about these things. You know, it varies. Your, it varies in your practice. Uh, it seems that John and I only get three rooted premolars. <laughs> um, some somebody doesn't like us, but uh, it's uh, it's just the, the the type of patients that you have. And if you're in a refer referral practice, obviously it will be even even higher percentages. But they're not they're not high. You know, 0.5 to six percent. It's a huge variation. Normally, there is one canal per root, thankfully, because these are very small teeth, very narrow roots, very spindly roots, very small canals. So, uh, and with that in mind, uh, we need to consider what file system we should use because these roots tend to be very spindly. Um, and this, this PA, although I'm missing the apex on this, on this shot, it just really showed me the split in that buckle, uh, buckle aspect. So the two buckle canals, they just split, and then you have the separate palatal. Uh, so intraoperatively, you would see this oval entrance, and then you see the two buckle canals are splitting about two, three millimeters below, further down into the uh, orifice. Um, now, if you are suspecting uh, a second canal. If you have the power of CBCT or imaging and you can tell that there are three routes, fantastic. But I think if, you, if you're suspecting something, what you're looking for is the angulation or the file. So the, the way the file falls into that, into that canal. Um, but to feel for these things, we tend to, we don't use straight files anymore. So you take a size 10 file or size 8, C pilot files, and you make a little curve on it. So you just run your, your two fingers, just the two, three millimeters at the tip of, of, of the file, and just to just pre-curve it ever so slightly. And then you walk it along the wall. So in this case, I would walk it in the mesobuckle corner and walk it down, and then I walk it on the distal buckle corner of that buckle aspect of the, of the root. What is also quite useful here, it's quite for those eagle-eyed will notice that you've got slightly different rubber dam clamp on this tooth. So... It's yeah. one thing, you know, kind of pre-curving files, et cetera. But you know, I, I'm going to take mm. a guess. If you've gone for this particular rubber dam clamp, so this is the uh, number nine rubber dam mm. clamp, why, why have you gone for that on this tooth? Yeah, just thinking outside the box a little bit, I, I think what, what works in this case is that the butterfly clamp has very small uh, teeth. So it's very helpful in, in small conical teeth, such as this premolar. This was the case. So it had a really good grip, a really good stability. And the other advantage is that I, in this case, I didn't have to do much restorative work coronally. I just needed to worry about the endo. So I didn't have to have space either side of my, of my uh, isolated tooth. And with the rubber, that, with this wing butterfly, what happens is because of the wings, it just keeps the rubber dam just slightly further away. So it just gives that little bit more space, although you're isolating only one tooth. So it's quick because you're doing one tooth. It's really um, stable because you've got those four prongs, sharp, small prongs. And because of the wings, it gives you the space. So it meets all of those criteria, the stability, the vi visibility, and, uh, and the ease of application. Um, so it's slightly unorthodox so it's not what the books tell you to use use it on an anterior that's it yeah and i think what you say about the, the visibility is quite key because you need to have good mm -hmm. vision to be able to mm -hmm. kind of do what you do you know we were talking there weren't you about the pre-curvature of the size 10s and walking one way and walking the other but again i mean the that shot with the paper points it doesn't look like that dramatic does it but actually it kind of it, it it highlights everything that's going on and the projections of the two different buckle uh, canals that you've mm. got there palatal the palatal uh, canal is that paper point more towards the left and you can see just straight coming out straight to the tooth whereas that mesa buckle is just angled um so if that happens and that you can do this with with files i chose to do it with the paper points but if we do it with a size 8 and a size 10 or two size 10s uh you will see that one is just leaning slightly uh off off angle uh, and i i find that the the buckle canals do point in slightly different directions that's how you you know there are there are two if you don't have a yeah. cbct for, for sure and uh, also you know we've talked about the hand files there um, in terms of the actual kind of 
definitive shaping what what things are you looking for in your uh, assuming you're going to go for nickel titanium uh, instrumentation mm. what what properties are you looking for in a case like this and what what did you choose here i i, I like uh heat treated instruments because they have that flexibility that pre-bendability so if you have a small mouth opening uh, you can pre-bend them in this case you have a split so i may need to just pre-bend the tip of my night eye walk it along one side so that i know i'm in the right buckle canal uh, so heat treated is the first thing uh, something with a small um, mfd so uh, the maximum file diameter something as small as possible because as i said earlier these these uh, roots and canals are very spindly. Some of these premolar roots have this lovely double curve at the tip. Uh, so I'm not going to open the apex too much. And I'm going to try, I, I would hope to keep the, the uh, maxim, maximum file diameter as small as possible up at the top. So I would go heat treated and a fine small file. So in this case, I used Trinatomy and I used, I finished with a prime. Yeah, perfect. I mean, I, th I think I, I would echo that. And uh... I mean, we're 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 a bit geeky, aren't we? And we like to design things. So this is uh, this is a, a bespoke tooth that we uh, we get made for our um, advanced restorative endo course, and and it it mm. kind of enables our dentists, our delegates, to be able to kind of understand how to deal with this type of complex treatment. So you've got a lower incisor and a classic one two one uh, Vitucci uh, configuration. So Vitucci is a uh, research uh, endodontist that looked at the anatomy of, of, of roots. And this is pretty common in a, a lower incisor. So 40% of these teeth have two canals and, you know, learning how to do it and using the right file system. So this is part of a tr true anatomy demonstration for us as well. Uh, it, it's really, really important. How and would you approach a case like this, John? You know, how would you prepare? Because we get, we get asked, we've got two canals that confluence or how do you go about this one? So for me, I, I kind of use the terminology, you've got sort of the, the major and the minor canal. And the major canal is always pretty much the buckle because that's the one that you're naturally uh, angulated to go into. So typically, you know, what I would do is prepare that and then uh, I would curving like you did for the, uh, the pre-molar teeth, mm. pre-curve size 10, find that lingual canal. And then there are little tips and tricks that we, you know, we often talk about in our training about how you work out whether these canals are joining uh, and then you prepare again using a, a controlled memory metal, um, small maximal fire diameter, small wire, so a 0.8 to one millimeter wire, ideally 0.8, so you've got something that's uh, not too destructive. Um, and then you, when you come to obturate it, it's exactly what you see here. So you go down the major canal first if you're doing a warm vertical, then do the minor, and then backfill the rest. Uh, it sounds so simple, but uh, it's actually it's an absolute beast of a um a demonstration this too um <laughs> it, it, it's great should we should we it's move great on because to... I, I do it normally yeah exactly should we move on to the next clinical case which is um well actually no we won't we'll have a look at your uh, post-op first should we look because i feel like i've got to give you the, at least thanks the, the glory shot <laughs> it's a it's a beautiful well, outcome it. this i mean it it's, and you can't um... you can't ever see the third route so it's really uh anticlimaxy you know, would you be, t in all seriousness though here, would you be tempted, given that you've got the midfill, where the midfill, you know, you've got good compaction. Because mm. you see this quite a lot on Instagram uh, and social channels is that people take multiple mm. views from multiple different angles. Did you just stick with this? And, and if you did, why did you not take another angulated view? Ah, oh, fair. So the, there's a couple of reasons. So I knew from my midfield that my cones were, uh, at least in the buckles, were in the right place and were well compacted. Um, all my measurements were reproducible. My GPs uh, went to where my measurements were, so there was no movement. I used the heat and my GP hadn't moved. Um, I, a new x-ray wouldn't have shown me anything else that would have changed my approach. So I will take an image if it changes my clinical approach. All that image would have done for me, a second image of this, a shift in the, in the tube would have shown me uh, a separation of the, of the roots, but I would not have changed my clinical approach in any, in any way. Um, in any case, to review this tooth, I will have to use a CBCT because there's so much anatomical noise in a year's time that I will need to rely on my CBCT to compare images. Uh, so I personally don't need 
don't, don't find the need to take three different images. And on a side note, because I uh, unfortunately work in a busy practice and my timekeeping is on the limit, uh, I don't really have time to take three different images. <laughs> so if the image is, is uh, fine clinically, um, for uh, the patient's sake, we move on with life and I let them get out of my chair. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my take. Would you have taken another image for that one? No, I wouldn't. I, I think for me, a baseline's a baseline. It's, uh, you know, what what you've just said there really, you know, very articulately is that it it's not going to change anything clinically. Uh, so you've, you've obturated, you can see the periapical radiolucency. When you take a review cone beam or you take a review radiograph in a year's time, you're either going to see resolution or not. So actually it's periapical change that is more important than the number of likes that you'll get on Instagram for the multiple different angulations that you get. So maybe I shouldn't uh, say that, but I, but I have. There we go. <laughs> wow. Thank cool. you very much for, uh, for grilling me on my case, John. I will return the favor next time. Yeah, here we go. Let's go in. It's, uh, this is uh, the upper second premolar. So this is uh, upper left mm. five. And it's interesting because I thought, I don't know about you, but this looked to me pretty straightforward, single canal, job done. Uh, it was to the point where I actually didn't comb beam this, Luca, because I thought mm. it looked so straightforward. I was like, I'm basically going to remove that restoration. I'm going to drop into the canal. Yeah, it's slender. There are some complexities there, mm. and we've kind of annotated a few bits here just to to kind of see. So the, the four, the seven were positive. The uh, six was fractured file unrestorable but you know sat there dormant quite happy and then the uh the five had a radiolucency non-vital uh, and we just make note of the angulation here because you you could mm. easily go offline with your access on a tooth like this um and it had a bifurcation uh, really interesting it was really deep as well sort of quite quite a long way down and and i'd prepared i'd gone in fully prepared a canal and then I just looked in under the scope and I could just see that little bit of accumulation of uh, debris um, that was mm. basically settling uh, into the canal on the side. And I thought, like, oh, okay, that looks interesting. And I, and I did exactly this with these files, just rotated it with a little um, uh, bend on the end of it and just got a, a small catch and actually just started working it, working it. And indeed, it was a, a second canal on this tooth, which is quite interesting because you don't see that that often in second premolar oh, was it quite low down or was it mid mid root yeah it was kind of mid root really um mm. it's yeah it, it, if we have a look at the the post op so we can see you know we've we've managed to kind of keep things relatively conservative okay it was a um true anatomy preparation again and, and for much of the same reasons and rationale behind the case that you showed actually i wanted to be the ability mm. to prove curve it's a slender root, so I don't want to go over opening this, even with something like, a, you know, seeing some of the new one mil wires coming out, Protaper Ultimate, for example. Yeah. I still think that that's not a preservation approach in a case like this. Uh, you could achieve this with an 04 taper system, um, but on a long route, I, I worry with a fixed taper system because you've got a lot of that file active at one time, so you have to do a lot of juggling with the crown down and in juggling you remove more dentine and more tooth structure so let's let's keep it super simple use a variable taper and it's kind of a, a protocol that we know which is a glide path file and a shaping file really really simple and then actually one of the hardest bits of this whole case was that dis that <laughs> distal margin which was it was a bit of a beast to try and <laughs> to try and do it and the reason that the six behind didn't offer any kind of like packability if you like it had there was nothing to hold it so there's a lot there's a saddle matrix there's a lot of ptfe tape there's probably enough ptfe tape to seal off uh, the toilet at home but uh, you know there was it was a really really tough case to, to isolate and um mm. I think I think the end result is really nice, so and it's going to go off. Did you remove the restoration, the amalgam, prior to jumping into the canal, or did you leave a bit of the distal amalgam there? I left a little bit of the distal amalgam there, like literally just a, a wafer thin bit, um, uh, while I was doing the endodontic treatment, just to make my life a little bit easier. Uh, mainly because the six behind was not a particularly great shape for 
uh, for clamping and keeping the dam down in that incidental area. So well, it, it, there's, a whole, there's a whole load of things that go through my head about why I left a little bit of the restoration there, but, but fundamentally it was so that we could just keep things um, a little bit more straightforward when it came to the restorative. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's nice. So I'm nice. hoping, uh, particularly from that's your case, Luke, it's lovely. I'm ho hoping there's been a few good tips and tricks, the pre-bending of the size 10, the choice of rotary nickel titanium, how we look at the, uh, the radiographs and, and the adjunctive use of comb beam as well. So hopefully that's been of some use. Thank you for your time as always, Luca. And uh, always a look pleasure. forward to Thank the next one. <laughs> Thank you, Cheers. guys. Bye. All the best. Bye-bye.